so again, just a, a little housekeeping. If everyone could keep off their um, their mics and cameras um, until there's um, sort of more participation going on, um, and I'll just introduce um, Linda Skipper, who is a conservator and heritage science scientist. She joined the University of Lincoln in 2011, having been previously employed by the National Trust and the Science Museum. She teaches undergraduate and postgraduate students on a range of topics, including preventative conservation and science, and is programme leader for the BA Conservation of Cultural Heritage at the University of Lincoln. Um, so this is the first session of um, the two-part um, pest management uh, lectures, um, and I will now hand over to Linda. Thank you very much, Pip. And for those people who have just joined, if I could um, please ask you to stay on mute so that we don't get um, feedback and so on, that would be really appreciated. I will be using the chat a little bit. Um, so I was just wondering if maybe you'd like to have a go with the chat now, because I don't know how familiar you are with Teams. Um, so if you have a look, it'll be at the top of your Teams um, screen there's something that looks like a speech bubble which says show conversation and if you click on that you should be able to see somewhere where you can type a message into the chat so can I just suggest that you um, all say a quick hello um, and where you're from so I'd love to I'd love to know where you all are are you all in in Wisbeach or are you a little bit further away so I'm just going to type in and say that I'm in Lincoln and then if you press enter then you're um, chat should come up. Ah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I grew up just near Cambridge, um, so I, I know the area there very well. Um, That's great. It looks like you have people from, from all over and I'm also very pleased to see that the chat is working OK. So that's always good um, to get us started. So what I'm going to do now is I will share my PowerPoint. I'll just um, make sure that everything's going as planned. So if you just bear with me for a moment, um, I will just up um, get my PowerPoint running um, and then I'll talk to you just a quick introduction about how we're going to do today's session. Um, there we go. So um, just getting that running now. Uh, so the plan for today then is two hours is quite a long time um, for everyone to sort of sit and listen, particularly on a, an online format. So I have um, structured in a few um, times when we can do a little bit of um, discussion and exercises so you'll get the chance to have a go at some of the things that we're we're talking about you can um, try and apply some of that at home and the other thing that we'll be doing is I'll have a bit of a break around about halfway through so that um, you're able to sort of stretch your legs and go and get another cup of tea or um, whatever you want at that point. So hopefully you'll now be OK to see everything um, on the screen. And I've got my cover slide up there, um, which just tells you that this is also part one. So you should have all received a link um, to next week's session as well. Um, the recording will be going up on YouTube. So um, if you are here now and not able to make the second session then so you can see the other one um, on YouTube at a later date. So what I'm going to be covering in this first part is really kind of three main things. Um, thinking broadly about where you might look for pests within um, say your own home or within a historic property or within a museum or in fact any other setting there's quite a lot of sort of common ground um, in between all of these um, then i'll move on to talking about setting traps for pests so that you can have a look at uh, in a bit more detail about which type of pests that you have and 
obviously from then, say you, if we're working our way through the process, you've looked for pests, so you've put some traps down and you might have some pests, but you also need to know what they are. And that's where the um, final part comes in, where we'll look at some identification of some common pests and I'll share some pictures with you to help you try and work out um, what sort of pests it is that you, you have if you find any. In the second part, what we'll be talking about, so this is in the, the talk next week, um, we'll talk about what happens if you do actually have some pests, um, what kind of things you might consider if you're deciding to do some treatments. Um, so what I'm hoping that you will learn from today is to be a bit more familiar with the signs that pests are present and also understand some of the main pests that might damage um, either the buildings or the objects that we have within our buildings. So it's designed to be a, a general overview. Um, now, what I'd like you to do now is just to type some ideas for all of the different types of pests that you can think of into the chat and um, we won't cover everything that you you come up with um, but I just want to get you thinking about what might come under the, the term of pests um, and then we'll we'll talk about exactly what I'm going to be covering today so if you have a go at putting something in the chat um, see what you can think of Ah, some great suggestions already. Thank you. Fantastic. Well done. That's brilliant. Um, so what we're seeing is you've got some of these kind of larger pests like birds and rats and mice um, and then we've got all sorts of different types of insects coming up that come under the, the category of smaller pests and what I'm really going to focus on today is these smaller insect pests um, and we'll talk about some of the specific ones that people have mentioned um, like sil things like silverfish I saw came up in the chat um, and so those those ones will be coming up in my talk today. So I'm not going to be thinking about things like mice and rats, which obviously are pests, but um, certainly in conservation, what we tend to think about in a much more focused way is about these kind of smaller insects that will get in and, and potentially cause damage. So that's what we're, we're going to have a look at. Um, and one of the terms that it's quite useful for you to just get a, an idea of um, is this abbreviation of IPM and that's called Integrated Pest Management. Now, historically, this kind of procedure IPM came about because uh, what people used to do was to um, treat everything with lots of chemicals, whether or not pests were around. So it was quite common that there would be a, a sort of routine of chemical treatments for lots of collections um, in museums and historic properties. And it was done more as a preventive measure. But increasingly people became very aware of the problems with doing that. Um, firstly, you're adding lots of chemicals to historic objects which might have long-term effects, long-term problems. But also um, there are health and safety implications for the person who's actually doing that kind of um, pest treatment procedure and for people potentially who handle any of those items afterwards. So alongside this sort of increasing awareness of the health and safety implications, um, many of these pesticides, um, certainly the, the particularly toxic ones, were in fact banned. So they were taken out of use. And that meant that people really needed to start thinking about a very different approach to how we think about pests. And this approach is something that we tend to call more preventive conservation. So what we try to do in conservation is to um, discourage pests from coming in in the first place and try and make our 
our houses, our museums um, as inhospitable as possible without actually doing anything to the objects themselves. Now, that doesn't mean that it works all the time. Sometimes you do need to do treatments directly onto the objects, but it means that those treatments where you do need to perhaps apply chemicals or other treatments are very targeted. And so it definitely reduces the amount of, of risk in terms of the health and safety side of things. And it reduces the risk in terms of the, um, the effect on the objects themselves. And the picture on the slide there is actually something you can see the petal dust. Um, it was a moth prevention sachet, which I just found in a, a wardrobe actually left in a house that we moved into. So I think this kind of thing is actually, you know, it, it wasn't just done in a, a museum basis. It was quite common that in people's homes, you would have all sorts of um, insect repellents or insect preventions around. And we're certainly very much moving away from that now. Um, the petal dust is probably about 1950s, 1960s, um, just sort of mainly based on the, the style and a, a similar one that I found in a museum. Um, so generally, IPM is seen as quite a holistic approach. Um, it covers all sorts of different elements of dealing with pests. And some of those we'll do today and some of those we'll talk about next week. So the ones that um, we're going to have a look at today, in part, we'll talk about some of the monitoring aspects um, in terms of the trapping program. But something we'll say for next week is thinking about um, some of the, the things around quarantine and maintenance. And today we're also going to be talking about, as I said, about the identification. Um, so thinking about being familiar with the different types of pests. Before we then move on to the following time, we'll talk about the, the other aspects of the section headed under treatment, um, how to set up IPM, um, and how to do that kind of quarantine, that building maintenance side of things that will help with the, the pest levels. So what I'd like you to do now um, is, again, I've got another short exercise for you. Um, I would like you to look around the room that you're in, whether that's a home, office space, um, and just have a think about where you think any pest entry points might be in wherever you are at the moment. Um, and then again, if you could type into the chat some of your ideas, um, then we'll talk a little bit about that and sort of the, the places that these, so we're talking the small insect pests, um, how they might get there. Um, Hi, Claire, I can see you've got your hand up. I think you just need to unmute yourself, Claire. Sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK, no problem. At least we know it works. That's great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just having a quick look through the chat, so I'm just having a, a look up to see some of the, the ideas that people are sharing. Fantastic. Yep, we've got some great ideas there, and I can see that you're um, thinking quite broadly as well as some of the, the different ways that insects might come in. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, they can come in on... Um, things that come in from outside um, we've got clothes cats other animals yep staff on people um, which is fantastic does anyone bring in flowers from the garden or anything like that I think there's another thing that we haven't mentioned on your list yet was old timber. That's 
great. That's a that's certainly a sort really kind of problematic source. Yeah, we've had someone brings in flowers. So any of these kind of things that come in from the garden. Um, one of the things about pests is actually while we find them a pest, the reality is they're just doing the kind of thing that they would do naturally. Um, they break down dead and decaying matter outside. They use it as their food source and it's just part of the, the food cycle. Um, things are naturally, they're a kind of a, a natural recycling method, if you like. What we're doing however is we're trying to to kind of break that cycle so we're saying well we don't want these things to break to be broken down we want to keep them because they are they're our homes they're our our precious objects and so actually we're trying to stop the pests doing what they do naturally and one fairly effective way to stop them doing that is if they don't come in and if they don't decide to live in our homes at all um, and you've got lots of ideas there about the different ways in which they can enter. Um, you only need really, really tiny gaps and cracks for them to be able to get in through um, areas that are, are part of the building structure. Uh, I see several of you picked up on windows, which is absolutely spot on. They can obviously in the summer, you might have your windows open, um, but there might be small cracks around the frames. It might They might not be completely tight. Um, they can come in through air vents, um, yeah, drainage system. And you can't stop those areas. You know, you can't completely seal your building up. Um, it's just not going to be practical. So what you need to be aware of is that there are these points that um, pests might come in. Um, one thing that I'm not sure if anyone's mentioned yet, I'll just have another look through, um, is around chimneys. So I don't know if any of you have a, any uncapped or unsealed chimneys, uh, but that's quite a, uh, a common entry point as well, particularly if the chimney isn't used very often. Um, you sometimes get birds nesting in the chimney and what will happen is that those birds will um, Hello, sorry, I've just been joined. This is Ben. Hi. Right. Um, so you get the birds have made building nests and thing. You'll have insects that live in those nests. Um, they'll break down some of the matter, um, you know, like the feathers, the bird poo, and then those insects will spread around um, and they will move out from the nests and they'll go to different places um, within within the house. So the next thing that I would like you to do, um, this might take you a few minutes because there could be quite a lot of things, but I would like you just to have another look around the room that you're in. So we've already thought about how pests might come in, um, but I'd just like you now to spend a few minutes looking around and thinking which things in your room could the pests eat? So what do you think is potentially vulnerable to these pests? You have to let other people work it out, Ben. You can't tell them things. So yeah, if you type into the chat once you have some ideas, um, then see what sort of things you have around. Great, thanks. That's some interesting ideas there. Yep, keep you, keep them coming. Fantastic. Mum uh, has one of my ideas. <laughs> what sort of things? I see you've got mention of um, skirting boards and floorboards. What sort of material are those skirting boards and floorboards made of? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got some some wooden bits in there for, for the structure of the, the building as well. 
Fantastic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, all of those things are really, really vulnerable. Um, and so you might find that pests will choose to live in um, or on the, the objects that we have in our homes, or they might choose to eat the parts of the building fabric itself. Um, but generally what we're looking at here is that the pests are eating some kind of um, natural material. Um, so we've got things that used to be living. Um, so things like, as you've absolutely correctly identified, any kind of paper-based items. You know, we've got some books there behind me. Um, they might be living on clothes, they might be living in the curtains, on the carpet, depending on what sort of um, materials you have. Now, if you have a, a kind of plastic or synthetic fibre type of carpet, then that's not very appealing to insects. What they really like are these more na is these natural materials, uh, particularly things like the the wool is especially um, delicious of the textile fibres, but they also really like silk. Um, so you'll find there's all sorts of different things. Um, and if you were to do this exercise in other rooms, um, you'll find the same kind of thing. Different areas will have different mixes of materials, but that there will almost certainly be something in every room that is potentially vulnerable to pests. Um, and uh, that I think makes it in some ways particularly challenging because you have pests in one area and they can quite easily then spread because they'll find other things that they want to eat and other things that they might enjoy. Okay. So we've had a look then at the kind of things that they like to eat, where they might come in. Um, so now we're going to move on and start thinking a little bit about um, what signs we're looking for when we're talking about um, looking for pests. And one of those first things is something that you probably do already, but you don't necessarily think about it in terms of pest management or anything like that. Um, you might just see the insects moving around. Um, so as you're, say, dusting down a windowsill, then you might spot that there are dead insects um, or pieces of dead insect. Um, the other sorts of things that you might notice is something that we call frass. That's a, a technical term. Um, but what frass basically is, is insect poo. Um, it's extremely small grains um, that are made from whatever the insect's been eating. And they often look quite quite round. Um, the picture that I've got on the screen at the moment shows um, some of this frass which has been magnified about 50 times um, and that's from wood. So you've got a fairly kind of pale wood colour in there. Um, the, the most common place that you will tend to see insects is actually on things like window sills because um, certainly the, the slightly larger insects that are a bit more mobile, um, the adults will often try and get outside or they'll be attracted to the windows um, and so you'll see them in that area. But you might see things in other places as well, you might say lift something up and see an insect sort of scurrying away from underneath it. Um, so in that case you might see live insects you may also notice damage to objects. So you might, for example, see that perhaps something has some, some holes in that you weren't expecting, that you don't remember being there before. And that's certainly a, a possibility. It's certainly a warning sign that maybe there's something going on. Um, so one of the, you know, one of the things that you can just do on a, a general basis is just to be be alert, be aware. You know, as you're say going around doing your cleaning, um, the kind of thing that you might see is something like that. Um, that was actually taken 
where I'm sitting, there's a couple of moths on the windowsill. Uh, we've had a lot of moths around this summer. And you are much more likely to see this kind of thing in spring and summer. Insects don't tend to go through their breeding cycles over winter unless it's particularly warm um, wherever you are and you've got lots of heating on. Generally, the insects will be most active um, sort of around about April onwards through to maybe September, October, depending on, on what the temperatures do. Um, so particularly around that kind of spring summer period is the time when you really want to to make sure that you're having a look out for it. Um, certainly finding live insects is quite a challenge, but that kind of thing that you're more likely to see is these kind of dead insects or damage, are probably the main ones. Now, alongside that, of course, it's quite a good idea to um, think about whether a trapping program would be useful. Um, there are a number of different types of traps that you can use, and I'm going to go through those with you now so that you can have an idea of, of what there is and what you might use them for. Um, so probably the blunder trap is the most common, um, and that's just for any insect. And then we have pheromone traps, which are designed to catch usually specific types of species. But one thing that is really, really important is that these pest traps are checked regularly. Now, our usual standards is that we would say check every three months. So you'd have a trap, you put it down somewhere um, and then you look at it after about three months. And if there's something caught in the trap, then you need to go through the identification stage. <clears throat> but yeah, one of the most important things is to actually remember that the traps are there and to remember when you need to look at them because it won't really help if it's um, just left down and left there for a few years. It won't necessarily be the most most useful or give you the most information. So this is a picture of a blunder trap um, and it's called a blunder trap because the idea is that the insects just wander around um, and they happen to walk over your sticky surface and then they get stuck to the trap. Um, so inside the trap, if I just put my laser pointer on, there we go. Um, so inside the trap in here is a sticky surface and this is one that hasn't had its label peeled back so it isn't actually on the, the full sticky bit. I just assembled it so that you could get an idea of, of what it looks like. Um, but you've got this very sticky surface there which runs up the back a bit there too. Um, and the insects walk in and they get stuck. So the intention is that they walk along uh, along the surface, they come to a, a bit just here and then they climb up and over and in and then that's when they get stuck. Now there is a little bit of a problem sometimes which is that the very small insects, you, if you think about something the size of an extremely small insect then even that little lip that we're talking about there, it's quite a jump. Um, it's a big thing. And so what these insects might prefer to do is if it's not quite fully sat down on the surface, if there's a gap underneath, um, then they might decide that they'd rather just go underneath it rather than climbing over it. Now that would obviously mean that you would miss some insects. There would be small things that you don't get to see. Um, one way around that is I'm not sure how clear it is on here, but um, on the underneath of the um, of the trap, there's actually another very small, well, fairly narrow, sticky, peelable piece. And one theory behind that is that you can use that to attach your trap to the surface so it doesn't go anywhere. But actually what I would tend to do with it is just to peel it back partly and not stick it to the surface, but actually um, you've then got a bit of a sticky trap underneath as well. So any of these kind of small insects that crawl underneath, I mean, fair enough, they might not get quite the right area, but you should actually pick up some of them um, that go underneath on that bottom sticky surface, so the one on the very underneath of the trap. Um, 
and that means that again it gives you a little bit more sort of versatility um, though one thing i should probably mention you'll see some of the traps in the photos that i've got for you are um, branded with a firm um, they're very kindly donated by histrionics for us to use in our teaching at the university of lincoln there are obviously other firms available who also supply insect traps um, but they are as i said they they donated these to us so that we can we can use those now, one of the problems with this kind of um, blunder trap this sort of shape here um, you might look at that and think well it's not very high and that's true it isn't massively high up but um, bats can still get stuck in this type of trap what happens is that the bats will be flying around they will um, detect where the insects are the insects that are stuck in that blunder trap and so they will fly down and they will try and catch the insects um, the consequence of that is that a bat can then get itself stuck to a trap um, now that's obviously would be a pretty horrible experience for anyone to find a bat in one of these traps but also it's actually um, a legal requirement that you must not kill or injure a bat um, so if you think that you might have bats in a building that you're working with um, I'd say particularly thinking about churches but also some historic properties may have bats that that live in the attics um, it's really risky um, and not advisable to use this kind of shape of cardboard trap uh, because of that possibility of bats but there are alternatives and I've got a couple here that you can see um, the black one just over here um, this has a black plastic outer casing and inside of it is a um, replaceable square of sticky card so again you peel the surface off and that's quite nice because it means that you're not using quite as many um, resources you can keep reusing this black plastic outer um, and just change the insert when it needs changing after you've checked it and as you can see um, on the photo below when it's closed up it closes down really flat and that means that the bats uh, cannot physically cannot get into that trap so even if they find insects they can't get in there and they cannot get stuck to it um, the clear one over here works on a similar principle but this one has a, um, a permanently inset sticky surface so if you get to the point where you need to change the traps if you've got too many things stuck to it um, then you need to at that point dispose of the whole trap but the the plus side of this clear trap um, is that you don't actually need to open the trap to see what's in there you can just have a quick glance at it um, and I'm aware that not everyone is a huge fan of spiders and you do get spiders trapped in these traps um, they're quite keen on the idea of insects as well so they will um, come along um, and try and catch an insect and unfortunately the spiders themselves will then end up getting stuck so if you are not a fan of opening traps and just want to have a quick look um, then that kind of pale clear trap can be quite effective those are the main types of blunder traps um, as I said these are the ones that catch pretty much any insect they just wander into it but then we have the pheromone traps so these are designed to be quite specific and they work on the basis that the traps contain some kind of female hormone so the males of that species of insect are attracted to the trap um, and then obviously they get stuck to it and the one that I've got here is a one that's specifically designed for moths um, so this trap the pheromoth trap um, when it's assembled it makes a sort of cardboard triangle and then you can hang that up so it's the kind of thing that you could for example um, place into a cupboard or a wardrobe if you have moths in in clothes um, or again you could leave that down on the floor so it's quite quite flexible about where that goes uh, but again just be cautious of bats because we've got 
um, quite a large triangular shape. Um, and if bats happen to be going for the moths again, they could potentially get stuck. Um, here's another style of pheromone trap. This one doesn't have its insert in, it just has a, a plastic outer in that picture. But inside that, you'd normally have a, a pheromone and a sticky pad that would attract um, different species of moth to it. And again, because it's got that, um, that hook, you can hang it up. Um, so again, it's quite useful to go into cupboards and wardrobes um, if you have problems with moths in say a, a collection of wool coats or something like that. Um, this one is a little bit different. It's very small um, and it's designed to catch certain types of larvae. Um, so these are larvae of um, mainly carpet beetle, but there are some other related types that will do it. And the way that this one works is instead of the um, there being a, a kind of sticky trap, um, you've actually, um, well, sticky trap impregnated with the pheromone, you've actually got a, a specific something that we call a lure in there. Um, so that's a like a tablet of pheromone almost that attracts things to it. And you can even change your blunder traps into a pheromone trap by buying a separate um, we call it almost like a, a sort of test tube, small shape of uh, material that contains a pheromone and you can stick that into one of the blunder traps. Uh, and again, you can use that on a, a pheromone basis. So they're quite diverse. You've got lots of, of different options, uh, but obviously when you use the ones that are specific, these kind of pheromone traps, you certainly need to know what it is that you are looking for. So you need to have a good idea of what species you're working with. Uh, but before we go on to talk about identification, I just want to do a, a couple more things with you, um, just explain a little bit more about the, the traps. Um, so one thing that is really, really important is that um, traps will sometimes get moved around. Um, if you happen to be in a historic property or a museum where um, there are visitors or there are multiple staff members and volunteers, um, then there is a risk that the pest traps may get picked up, uh, say if someone was cleaning that area of the floor and then they might get moved to somewhere else. And then you could end up not knowing which pest trap is which or where, if say it had picked up a number of pests, where those kind of problems species were because it's been moved and that means it's a really good idea to put a label on it and even if you're doing this in a domestic house um, having a label on at least means that you are a little bit less likely to forget where things were um, because again even when it's in your own home it's really easy for someone to just pick it up and move it somewhere else so a label saying what date you put it there, when it was last checked to remind you of that kind of three monthly check um, and where it's supposed to be will really be quite useful to you. And one thing that you can do is if you have a floor plan, you can mark on the floor plan where each trap is going. So it means that you can kind of map it, map it out a little bit, um, which again gives you a nice, a nice visual record um, but also for anyone else involved, again, it helps them to understand where those traps have, have been placed and what the decisions were for that. Um, so what we've covered so far is thinking about what types of traps we can choose, um, where the pests might come in um and what sort of things the pests might like to eat so we know the kind of um, the materials that are particularly vulnerable and so what we're going to do now alongside a break is to actually start thinking about where to put these traps now there is a, a kind of basic principle to this which is that pests prefer to walk around the edges of spaces um, if you have a a big room or indeed any size of room and 
it's reasonably open it's got a path through it um, we would just follow the open path through it pests don't work on that same kind of basis they feel a lot safer walking around the edges of things so that means that pests are much more likely to for example walk around the skirting board rather than um, to take a perhaps what we might think of as a more direct route say from one corner to the other corner okay um, so that's the the basic principles of what we're thinking about here now before we go off and I explain the the exercise that I'd like you to have a go at um, does anyone have any questions So you're welcome to either type into the chat or to raise your hand at this point if you have anything that you'd like to ask me about sort of the, the traps. Okay. Um. Yeah, so these traps are all ones that are um, absolutely fine to use in the UK. I haven't researched other countries, so I don't know whether there are any other restrictions, but all of these are perfectly fine to use in the UK. Um, the only kind of question around legality, Richard, is around um, if you choose to use, say, a blunder, a blunder trap that's just the sort of standard cardboard type um, when you know you have bats then potentially you could be breaking the law if you then caught one of those bats um, but apart from that yet yeah, they're all they're all fine to use uh, and are, are currently approved for use in the UK Great, thank you. Is there anything else that anyone would like to ask about before we move on to the next exercise? Okay, uh, so I'll explain what we're going to do then. Um, what I would like you to just have a think about is knowing all these things that we've covered already. Um, have a look around. I'm going to say a few areas. So that could be, say, depending on if you're in a smallish private house, maybe you'd like to have a look around your downstairs and make a list of where you think you would put pest traps and what sort of pest you would put in um, or the upstairs, if you would prefer. So maybe sort of three or four rooms worth of thinking about where you would put some traps. If you work or volunteer somewhere that's a, a historic property or a museum, then um, you might want to just kind of have a think about some of their collection rooms and decide where you might want to put traps in some of those if there aren't any traps there already. So I'm happy for you to be a little bit um, creative with this and just kind of decide which which space you would like to do. But um, don't give yourself too much to do because we're not having a really, really long break. Um, but what like I said, what I would like you to do is to perhaps you could sketch out on a piece of paper to help you try and remember what you're thinking about. Um, very brief room plan mark on there where where you're going to put some traps and what sort of traps you would like to do and i'm going to suggest that you do this alongside our break um, so i would say probably something like 15 minutes would take us to 7 30 and i think that would seem reasonable for people if people want a cup of tea and to think about pest traps at the same time and then when you come back I'll ask you to share your thoughts about where you might put these traps and what sort of traps you would choose. Okay does anyone have any questions about that before we head off? <laughs> 
OK, I will see you all again in a few minutes at 7.30. Thank you.
Sylvia, I think we might need to mute your microphone. If you haven't already, thank you. That's great. If I could just ask if everyone just to double check that they're they are on mute, that would be brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so it's about half past, according to my computer anyway, um, and hopefully at least some of you are, are back um, and have some thoughts about what you might like to do. And I would love to hear um, what you've been thinking about um, when you've been looking around. So if you want to uh, type something in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, Yes, thank you, Richard. That's been that's really useful. And thank you, Claire. Um, so we've got so people have been thinking about the kind of things where um, where the items are that they might like to eat, about where they might like to live, um, about where they might decide to come in. I'm just going to wait a couple of minutes because you, you might have a, a little bit to type in. I want to make sure that people have time to contribute if they would like to. So I'll just give you some time to um, share your thoughts if that's what you want to do. Thank you, Anita. Yep, so we're, we're thinking about, um, again, some of the vulnerable items like the taxidermy and clothes and the wardrobes, and also thinking about, again, some of those entry points um, in there. And Mario, yep, thank you. That's great. Um, so you're working with a museum then, and we've got Jade working with an art gallery who are, again, thinking about some of the different um, different materials and uh, where the traps should go within that. Fantastic. Well, I hope that's been a useful activity for you to have a think about. Um, so, oh yes, Kerry, thank you. So we've got some um, historical costumes that you're thinking about. Um, so with these, the traps you did say about um, the stickiness, so with the traps, the stickiness is actually contained within the trap. So you've got a kind of, um, usually the, the diamond trap, for example, has a, a plastic outer and the, the ferromoth has a cardboard outer. So all of the stickiness is inside. Um, so unless your wardrobe is really, really tightly packed together, um, there's no reason why any stickiness should get onto the clothes when you've got those kind of... Um, the pheromone traps in there. Ah, yes, the old underfloor heating, that's an interesting challenge. Uh, think about how to deal with that. Oh, I can see you've really kind of taken on board what we've been talking about already, which is fantastic. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is just some some things to consider. So I see that a number of you are considering the pheromone traps um, and that's one of those interesting questions actually uh, that I don't have an absolute answer to because there is some concern that if you have a pheromone trap and you don't already have moths is there a risk that the pheromone traps might draw moths in? Um, and so far, there isn't any kind of clear answer as to whether or not that does give an increase in the the risk of moths 
Um, so if you're using one of those pheromone moth traps. Um, so there are some organisations that will use pheromone traps as a routine, even if there aren't any current signs of moth. And there are some organisations that will only use pheromone traps if they know that there is already a particular, um, either a very high risk collection, um, say, uh, there is lots of wool, for example, or silk, or um, if they already have an idea that they think there's moths and they want to know if there really is or not. So I can't give you an absolute answer on to whether you should have pheromone traps or not. I haven't seen enough evidence either way, and um, that's something that you have to, to weigh up depending on your collection, the objects that you have and how vulnerable you think they are. Um, the other really interesting thing to think about when you are deciding on traps is that um, when you're thinking about it in a, you know, a sort of relatively small scale, you're thinking about, some of you are thinking about your own home or perhaps a single room space or a couple of rooms, then yeah, it is manageable to have multiple traps in multiple locations across each room. If we're talking some kind of a much larger museum or a big historic property, they might be a hundred rooms or you know, maybe even more depending on how sort of things like office spaces and so on uh, within that. So what you have to start thinking about is also the time aspect of the traps. So we know that we need to trap to check what's in the traps every three months, which actually doesn't sound all that much really. And when you only have a small number of traps, four or five maybe, um, it won't take you all that long. But if we start talking about traps maybe having so let's say, for example, there were four, 100 rooms which had four traps per room, then you've got 400 traps to look through. And that's actually a really, really big project and it becomes extremely time consuming. And so often when you have these kind of larger areas, you have to start finding an appropriate balance. So you have to start thinking about what's actually feasible in terms of the amount of time that you have available to to look round, um, also the cost of getting set up. Traps themselves are not expensive. Um, we're talking sort of low pounds, depending on which type you go for. The the standard cardboard blunder trap a bit less. The um, see the the pheromone traps are a bit more expensive, but we're not talking. A real about a really expensive thing in here. However, um, if you have if you do have four hundred of them, that's when it starts to really add up. So you just have to think realistically about what you can do and what's manageable. Um, if you aren't doing trapping already and you want to get set up, then one of the things that is quite a good idea is to actually start thinking about. Um, you, whether the traps are in the right place. So if you have a trap down and it doesn't catch anything for a year, um, then it's probably either that you don't have insects or that it's in the wrong place. But if it hasn't caught anything for a year, that area is probably OK, to be honest. Um, so maybe you don't need that trap after all. And sometimes a, there is just this little bit of what I've probably describe, best describe as trial and error in terms of trying to find the best places that are going to maximise your chances of catching any insects. Because you, you wouldn't expect to catch absolutely everything, all insects that are around. Um, what you might more realistically end up with um, is a, a sample of what's in the area and then it just flags up any issues that you might have. OK, um, so just some things to think about. Like I said, there's no with this kind of trap positioning and which types to go for. Um, there isn't this kind of 
absolute right and wrong answer. Sometimes it is a case of getting to know the building um, and then deciding where the, the main problem areas are uh, that you really need to keep traps working in that space. Um, so what we're going to move on to now is just thinking about this kind of idea of identification. You know, you might have a, a trap that looks a bit like the picture on there, but you need to know what they are because obviously at that point is when you start thinking about is this a problem or is it not? So unless you have a pheromone trap, the, the traps, the kind of blunder style, they're not going to distinguish between pests and just a random non-pest insect. Uh, so what you need to know is which ones are your actual pests, which ones do you worry about? Which means it's really, really important to be able to accurately figure out what sort of thing you've got. Um, I'm going to be talking about a few now and show you some pictures. This is not all of the pests that you might potentially find, but I've decided to focus on some of the most common ones um, so that you get to see um, roughly what sort of things you might come up with. And I've also, towards the end, I've got a couple of resources for you so that should you find something that you don't know what it is, um, at least you, that means you know where to look uh, for, for finding more information. So I've divided these up into um, kind of their, their method of action, I suppose. So um, insects that shred whatever they're eating, insects that bore holes in things and insects that graze just on the surface. And I'll run through each of these in turn. So we'll start out with some shredders. So I'm going to start out with thinking about carpet beetles and clothes moths. And starting off with the carpet beetle then. There are a few different types of carpet beetle. I remember um, earlier there was a mention of woolly bears when I was asking about some different pests. And this is what the woolly bears are. Um, we've got the larval form just up here. Um, so again, these are magnified images, um, something between about times 40 and times 60. I had to vary it a little bit, but you know, we're, we're zoomed in quite a long way. Um, and this, what you're actually seeing here under the, the larval form picture is the skins. So as the larvae grow, they shed their skins, they get bigger, and it's very rare for you to actually see the larval that form themselves, um, what you'll see is the, the cases that are left behind as the larvae grow. And this larval form is what actually does the damage. The adults are much less um, problematic. They'll obviously fly around, they'll lay the eggs, and you might see some of the carpet beetles in traps, so the adults in the traps. You might um, see them on windowsills but it's very rare that you'll see a live larvae. Um, the reason that the larval form is called, is just known generally as a, a woolly bear, um, other than the fact that it's, I guess, slightly woolly, um, there are multiple species of carpet beetle. Um, certainly four main ones that we tend to see in historic properties. But when it's in the larval form, you don't know which sort it is. Um, so we just have this kind of generic name for them because you can't tell the difference between between what they are. Um, so these pictures were done on the magnification, but just to give you a bit of a better idea of the kind of sizing that we're talking about, um, I just took a snap of those without any magnification, just um, just using my phone so that you get a bit more of a sense of the, the kind of size and and scale of these because they are actually really pretty small. Um, they've got some sizing on there on the slide, which you can see, you know, we're talking a few a few millimetres long. Um, and I've also listed on there the different types. We've seen the varied carpet beetle already. There's a picture of the vodka beetle on that slide. The Guernsey carpet beetle looks fairly similar um, to the varied carpet beetle, but it's got a little bit more white on it. It is very hard to tell the difference. Um, 
And then we've got the two spot carpet beetle, which it's not the most inventively named. It does have two spots. Um, and they have particular things that they like to eat. Um, these kind of carpet beetles, I know they're called carpet beetles, but it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, I mean, they, they would eat carpets, but it's not just carpets. They certainly like all sorts of different natural products. And you can see all the information up there on the slide. So I won't read through the, the full effect, but um, have a look at that. And as I said, it's the larval form that does the damage and they like to be somewhere that's nice and quiet and, and undisturbed. So this is again one that's, that's quite popular um, in finding these kind of nice quiet spaces. Vodka beetle is quite interesting. Um, it, it got its name it's a, from its Latin name, which is Smanovii. Um, so the common name ended up being a vodka beetle, but it's actually from Africa um, and it was transferred across from other countries. It's not unusual that you get this kind of transfer and it was certainly not known in the UK before the late 70s. And at that point it was discovered in one or two museums and then gradually it's been noted that it spread to, to other museums. And that's because of the transfer of, of collections, you know, objects going on loan, moving from one museum to another, sometimes we'll have some um, unwelcome, unwelcome passengers uh, joining in. And um, we also have things like climate change having an impact. So some insects that wouldn't necessarily have survived in a sort of more northerly climate, for example, um, as things get warmer, they are actually more able to thrive in our, say, UK environment. So we are seeing some kind some changes in the pest species in the UK, both from impacts of climate change um, and also from human activity. Um, and it's unfair of me to just blame museum loans because you know, insects can hitch a ride on on all sorts of transfer, transport from one country to the next. So it can just be general human activity with people moving from one place to another. Um, if anyone doesn't feel comfortable seeing taxidermy, then um, look away now because I'm going to show you a picture of some damage. Um, it's quite an ex extreme picture and a really horrible looking taxidermy creature. Um, so what you can see on here is that this animal has mostly got bare skin now. You can also see it quite clearly on here. You've got a little bit of fluff left, a bit of fur, but actually he's it's mostly bald. And that's been damaged. It's been eaten by these kind of carpet beetle larvae um, to the point where it's really kind of beyond conservation. We actually use this part of our teaching collection so that people are able to um, have a look at it and see the kind of damage that insects can do um, if their uh, impact is left fairly unchecked. So if anyone was looking away, we now have moved on to the next slide, so no more taxidermy. Um, and we've moved on to have a look at a picture of one of the moths. Now, moth species are again varied. There are more moth species than I'm going to mention here because I'm going to pick up on two common types of moth, but there are certainly others um, that you may find, but these are the ones that people tend to see most in historic properties. Um, so with the web enclosed moth, um, as you see on the picture there of the, the adult, again a magnified image, um, it tends to be a bit more sort of golden coloured on its wings. The other type of moth that I'm talking about, which is case bearing clothes moth, it tends to be a little bit more silvery, but it can be a, quite difficult to tell. And the kind of typical damage that you'll see from moths is sort of finding holes in things like the, the woolen mitten that I've put up on the slide here. Um, so both of these species of moth 
um, have a similar life cycle. So they'll have the adult form, which lays eggs, and then the larvae hatch out, and then they will cocoon and turn into an adult. And again, it's this larval form that's the most damaging. So it's the larval form that actually does the eating. Um, and again, the name is a little bit misleading because as I think some of you have probably thought of already, they certainly don't just eat clothes. They will eat all sorts of different things. Um, so they will really enjoy things like wool and hair, um, They'll also happily eat things like all sorts of upholstery, um, silk. So quite a, a broad number of categories that they will happily chew their way through. Now, the reason that it's called a webbing clothes moth is that you will see webs left behind. And we're not talking kind of spiders webs, but you will see these kind of longish trails um, where the moths have been um, and where they've been eating and sometimes that's the easiest way to figure out whether you have webbing clothes moth or case bearing clothes moth because case bearing clothes moths have cases and so you'll have these slightly more uh, rather more discreet case shapes left behind which are discarded by the larvae as they grow um, rather than these kind of longer webs now, although I've mentioned that the larvae um, can take about 30 months to then go through the next stage of the life cycle, we, again, with usually, particularly in warm summers, you might well see two breeding cycles taking place in a year um, in that kind of summer period. They don't tend to see it happening over winter unless again you've got sort of extensive heating going on in that property they certainly prefer the warmer temperatures to go through that life cycle um, but there has been some evidence that they might be increasing the rate at which they um, go through that larval stage so um, potentially some places have seen three cycles in a year and the problem with that of course is that the faster they go through the life cycle, the more moths you end up with. Um, so that can be, again, something just to, to look out for. So the numbers of moths can increase quite quickly. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, cat. <laughs> right. Um, so this is the case bearing clothes moth. And hopefully you can just about see that this is not quite as golden as in the last picture, but as I said, it can be quite challenging to tell the difference. It's a lot easier if you happen to have them side by side, but they're not always that convenient, of course. Um, and I've also put up a picture of the larva in its case, um, just so that you get an idea of what the, the cases might look like should you see something like that. Um, on the next slide, I've got a more um, zoomed out image again I just took a, a quick picture with my phone this is a, a one of the case bearing clothes moths that we've actually mounted on a slide hence the the surroundings um, but that again I hope that gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of size that we're talking about um, the sorts of things that you might see and it may well be that you've spotted some of these around your home this year already um, Anecdotally, there seems to be a few more about than perhaps we've seen sometimes. They do prefer things to be a little bit damper, um, slightly damper conditions to the webbing clothes moth. Um, but in general, um, the kind of things that they like are pretty similar. Um, they really like all sorts of organic materials, particularly textiles, but certainly not exclusively. Uh, they like to live in bird's nests. That's one of those that I mentioned. Um, so you might find if you have a bird nesting in a chimney that, or in the attics, then their nests can introduce some of these moths. So our next one is the borers. Um, so these are the ones that make holes in things. Um, and woodworm is the name that you might be more familiar with. 
that's something that makes holes in wood. Um, but actually, that's the woodworm is specifically used as the term for the larval stage um, for this pest. The adult beetle is known as the furniture beetle, and they're certainly not worms. They're definitely beetles. Again, this is another one where the larval stage is the one that's damaging. Um, and sometimes the only real signs that you'll have of this will be the emergence holes. You might see adults on windowsills, for example, but you won't see the larva itself because they stay within the material. And then when they're ready to become an adult, that's when they will come out of the wood. So before that point, they'll be happily living inside the wood and, and chewing their way through tunnels. Um, and then the adults will come out and they will look for somewhere to lay some eggs. Fresh holes, they tend to be a bit cleaner, um, but just seeing holes on its own doesn't necessarily mean that you have an active problem with woodworm. There's lots of historic buildings that have had woodworm in the past, but um, they particularly if it's things are a little bit drier, um, then those woodworm, that furniture beetle, it might not necessarily be currently causing problems. One of the things that people sometimes are a little unsure of, and the reason for the picture on this slide, um, is just to so that you get an idea of the contrast between the hole sizes. So we've got furniture beetle hole size compared to death watch beetle whole size. Um, so I'll talk about Death Watch more in a moment, but um, obviously sometimes you might find the actual beetles and that will help. But if you just have holes and you're not sure which type it is, then looking at the size will help you because Death Watch beetle holes are pretty big because the adults themselves are pretty big. Um, if you want to have a bit of an idea to whether or not this might be active, um, then do look for, for signs of other pests around and do your trapping because that will help. Um, the death watch beetle, as I said, they've got some really big holes. Um, they're similar looking brown beetles, um, so you will probably find, um, again, you just need to try and get some kind of magnification if you want to be really sure of what it is that you're looking at. But sometimes you will find something quite distinctive in the, if there is death watch beetle, um, you might hear a, a tapping noise. So the males tap um, to attract a mate. It's certainly, again, the larvae do the damage. Um, so, but they do tend to like very damp conditions. So do think about um, whether there are any damp areas of the building, because that's a point where it can certainly be much more vulnerable um, and a place where the insects might like to to live. Um, and they obviously really like wood, just like with the furniture beetle. As I said, you will find these kind of larger holes. And again, depending on the temperatures and the life cycles, sometimes it can be um, anywhere between four and 12 years for them to actually go through that life cycle and to hatch out into um, a sort of full adult form. In terms of the grazers, I'm going to give a mention to silverfish and book lice. So the trap image that I showed when I was just kind of bringing this section of the talk in was actually a trap that had quite a lot of silverfish in. So actually quite a lot is a large number of silverfish. So if you saw something like this, then you'd certainly want to start looking around for, for what they might be doing and where they might be living. Now, these are grazers, which mean that, as you can see from the book here, most of it's actually all right, but it's just this kind of these edges where they've sort of taken off um, the surface of that cover. And that's really typical of silverfish. It's the sort of thing that they will um, just kind of chew away at a surface. So they won't make holes in it like the um, furniture beetle or the death watch. They will just sort of chew away at it a bit. Um, one of the things that I've 
occasionally noticed is sometimes they have a preference for say a particular color um, so they'll graze away at the surface of the paper and they will eventually eat through but sometimes they might prefer the taste of one particular color of ink um, so I've actually seen wallpaper that's silverfish damaged where um, all of one color was missing um, but all the rest of the paper actually looked all right so they yeah they they have some particular preferences now I suspect that most of you have probably kind of come across silverfish without realizing that there are actually multiple types of silverfish and um, the existence of something called the paper fish which is a slightly different type of silverfish it's a gray silverfish um, it was only really characterized in the uk in 2014 but there is a little bit of uncertainty around those kind of dates because there probably would have been an awful lot of looking at a thing that looked like a silver, fairly like a silverfish and thinking it's a silverfish because they're pretty fast. You know, they will um, they like it being quite dark, so they will tend to to hide in these kind of dark, dark corners. So you wouldn't necessarily see notice a difference with a live one. Um, and you'd have to look really closely at any that were in traps to work out what sort of silverfish you had. So the common silverfish is the one that we knew about. Um, and then we have these kind of ones which are called paper fish. Um, as far as we were aware, the common silverfish actually doesn't really like it being too dry, uh, but it appears that the paper fish will happily tolerate much drier conditions, which isn't really good news for um, caring for collections because it means that you can't dry things out and hope that the silverfish go away um, you're at, it means that you're going to have to take some other sort of measures and they particularly like paper and books but they will eat sort of all sorts of kind of starchy foods like wallpaper paste glues um, sort of the more kind of organic glues so they will graze away on all sorts of different things it's not just the perhaps more typical paper that you might think of. Now, book lice are very small and quite hard to spot. We might be talking sort of about a millimeter or less and they are quite translucent in color. What the places where you might see book lice, you might open up a book and just see a book louse right right in the inside of the spine um, and in small numbers they're really not a problem they're quite a, a normal thing to have around but if you do start seeing them in particularly large numbers it, because they're so small they will graze but they don't the damage is quite insignificant because small numbers with something very small um, doesn't tend to do too much damage um, when you start getting larger numbers, that's when you start getting problems with the infestations. And this is slightly different because you do get damage from both nymphs and adults. So they don't go through this kind of larval stage. You have um, the eggs and then you have the nymphs, which are a bit like small adults. And then you have the big ones, which are the, the full adults. And silverfish is the same, actually. They have a, um, a nymph and adult stage, all of which can can cause damage and they'll happily eat things that are fairly similar to the kind of things that the silverfish would like um, they'll also eat mold so if you have little bits of mold on the surface they'll happily eat their way through that um, but they very much prefer damp conditions so they have a but they have a, their breathing breeding cycle is normally about six months, but it does depend on um, what the temperature is like, how humid it is, how damp it is. And then if it's warm enough and there's good food around and nice and damp, um, then they might go through a breeding cycle about every six weeks. And that obviously, again, that accelerates the point at which these these pests might potentially become a problem. <laughs> 
those ones are the main pest species that I wanted to run through, but I thought it was also worth uh, mentioning a couple of other things. So one of those is cluster flies. Now, these look a bit like normal house flies, but um, yeah, apparently they are a little bit bigger, although I couldn't say that I've lined one up alongside to double check personally. Um, the picture doesn't entirely show cluster flies. There was a, um, a wasp that snuck in there as well. They actually have an outside life cycle, so it's quite unusual and a bit disgusting because the adults lay their eggs outside in the grass in the spring and then these larvae actually live within earthworms and uh, they develop within the earthworms bodies and then the adult flies sort of explode out of it and they emerge in the autumn but what these cluster flies are, are trying to do in the autumn is that then they want somewhere to hibernate and it's not unusual for them to decide that this nice quiet attic space is good. Um, they quite like warm south facing walls and then they'll have a bit of a rest on there in the warmth and then they will go inside the building through um, through gaps around the windows or maybe through the eaves or through air vents. Um, and the reason that they're called cluster flies is that you don't get just one cluster fly. What you actually get is funny enough a cluster. So you can end up with lots and lots of flies coming in um, and they like to hibernate in clusters. There will sometimes be over a thousand flies in, in one of these clusters and what they will do is they stay inside hibernating until the spring when they want to go back outside and, and reproduce. The problem is that we have heating and that confuses them. So this kind of warm conditions inside will make them wake up and they will start flying around and then they will discover that they can't get out and then they will die on windowsills in large quantities. Um, the main problem with them, they're not a pest species, they don't actually eat the, um, the collections, but they're a great supply of food or other than obviously being unsightly, the insects also really like to eat on those. And you can get quite a lot of cluster flies building up even just in the space of a day, should you have a, um, an infestation in one of the spaces and they've woken up, which means that you need to do quite a lot of cleaning to try and um, remove all of these flies. Um, so I've got a little mini quiz now for you to have a go at. Um, so I just want you to type into the chat. We'll go through them one at a time. So do you think a spider is a pest species? So you can either type pest if you think it's a pest, or you can type not if you think it is not a pest. Yay, fantastic. Spot on. So, yep, spiders are most definitely not pests. Um, they're actually quite useful. I know not everyone wants them in their homes, but actually um, spiders are, are good things. So they help stop any of these unwelcome pest species from um, establishing a, a colony or a presence within our homes. Great, well done. OK, what about a wood lice or wood louse? Is that a pest or is it not? So again, if you want to type pest or not in the chat. Okay, good stuff. Thank you. Um, so let's see what happens. I press my button. There we go. It's not a pest. Now you will often find these in pest traps if it is damp um, and if you find a lot of them in a pest trap it can indicate a problem um, because it can indicate that you've got some kind of very damp conditions somewhere because they do like it to be really damp. Um, 
So it's certainly an indicator that there might be an, an underlying problem, but in itself, it isn't a pest. Um, OK, our last one, wood weevils. What do you think about that one? So again, if you want to type into the chat and say pest or not, depending on what you think. Fantastic. Hey, oh, people think they're a pest. Let's see what happens when I press my button. You are spot on. Um, yep, so these are pests. Um, you do sometimes find them in buildings. They are relatively unusual. So they only really like to eat wood that's had a bit of damage to it, ideally from sort of fungal growth. So if you've had any um, rot on timbers, um, they prefer damp wood as well, but if it's had fungal attack and then it was damp and then it's dried out, they'll still keep eating it if um, if that option's available. Um, so something to keep an eye open for, they do have quite a distinctive snout, um, this kind of fairly long bit just here. Um, so if you see some one of those, they're only sort of a few millimetres long, but you'll still even with the naked eye, you'll be able to see them quite clearly as, as being around. And it's again, it's certainly a, an indicator that there might be a problem, um, possibly with some of the wood in the structure of the building where you are, that there might have been some kind of issues. So it's definitely worth trying to figure out where they are. Um, if they're, for example, eating through the floorboards um, or something like that. Because it may also mean that you need to check for other um, other problems. So things that will be really helpful to you for figuring out what pests you've got, there's a link there to a poster, which is an English heritage poster. The picture that I've got on the slide there is actually the old design for the, the poster. They've got a new one now. Um, you can download the new one as a PDF or you can ask their customer services and they will send you out a free printed one. And that's done through English heritage. It's a really great resource. Um, so do make use of it. We are um, just waiting for our new new star ones to be delivered because they really are very recent. Uh, they're really, really useful. There's also some online fact sheets from the Collections Trust that you might find useful. So if you want to know more about different specific pests, then um, you can navigate there and have a look at it. And like I said, this is all being recorded. So if you want to pick up the links later, um, you'll be able to have a look at the recording um, and follow those through. Now, something that really will help you if you have traps and you want to identify pests or you want to look at things that you've seen on windowsills, um, trying to do this with the naked eye is quite a challenge. There are some pests that are reasonably distinctive, but there are some um, where it can be a lot harder to figure out which is which. Um, so. We tend to use a, a times 10 magnifier. We use a, a loop style because it's so this is all sort of a, a jeweler's type where you fold out a small glass and then it folds back in again. But any kind of magnifying glass will help. Now, obviously, when they're on pest traps, they're stuck to the traps. You're not going to be taking them off. Uh, the picture that I've put up on the slide is of a magnifying pot, which is the kind of thing that you could use if you had a a loose pest that you'd picked up, um, say, around the house or um, from a windowsill that you'd noticed, you could put that in the, the magnifying pot. What I used for some of the images in this presentation, the magnified ones, is I used a, um, a digital microscope, which you plug into a computer or a laptop um, through a USB port, um, and then you can use software that comes with the digital microscope to then take some pictures um, of the pests that you see. And that can also be quite a, a useful tool if you want something that's a bit higher magnification to try and work out what sort of things you might be dealing with. So 
you've got your traps, you put them out, you've counted, you've identified your insects. Um, it's really, really important that you actually start thinking about keeping a record of that. And again, I'm not going to tell you what the right way is of doing that because there are pros and cons to different approaches. Obviously, if you have just a sheet of paper and you're making some notes on a sheet of paper about what you've got, then that's a good starting point. But you do risk um, things getting lost. So you might forget where you've put your paper three months before and then you can't update it. You also don't have necessarily such a, a clear system for tracking changes through different time periods across years. Um, so personally, I prefer an Excel spreadsheet, but not everyone is um, necessarily comfortable with using database software um, or electronic checking. And there are risks with that as well. If your only backup is on one computer and then that computer ends up with a virus or it stops working, then you might end up losing the sheet. So you have to make sure that your file is something that you have backups of. Um, and also that you are able to maintain access to it so that you're not using a file format that then becomes obsolete because then obviously you're not going to be able to to open it. Um, so do just give some thought to that about how you might do some recording. Um, and then the next question really is what when do you start worrying? Um, so you may have all these these numbers, but at what point do you start to be concerned if you found, say, a couple of moths or something like that? Um, and there isn't any kind of specific set number of pests where you should start worrying. Um, you do have to be sensible and be realistic. There will be times when a few insects just come in from outside, get stuck in the trap. It's not necessarily a case that if you see a moth, you definitely have a moth infestation, for example. If you don't have any past data to work with, then in general, I'd say that if you have more than 10 of one species in a building, um, then it's worth just kind of having a look around and seeing whether there is any obvious areas, obvious issues. Um, so you can have a look around objects or um, other nearby areas, though I appreciate it's not always possible to do things like um, lifting carpets to check floorboards, for example. So you can work to this kind of number of 10. Um, obviously, if you know your building um, and you've got past data and you know that it's kind of normal that every August you see 15 moths in a trap, then you don't panic if you find another 15 moths in a trap, but you would worry if you maybe got 30 because you'd know that that had gone up significantly. So you just need to kind of think about this sort of context and then um, react accordingly. But that isn't something that you're going to establish until you have some historic pest data that you have recorded. Um, so if you are just starting out, then um, just go with the, the kind of rule of 10. Um, and see see how that works for you. So what we've talked about so far, I'm just coming to the end of today's session. Um, I've given you an overview of pest monitoring and ID, which together along with the things we'll talk about next week, all come together to form this successful IPM program. Uh, so next time we'll have a look at how we might discourage pests in houses um, and what sort of things that you can do if you find a pest infestation. Uh, and the picture that I've got on here is some case bearing clothes moths, by the way. So there are a range, a huge range of different sites and, and resources that you can visit. Um, I've put up one called museumpests.net. It's designed slightly more for um, people working in museums and historic properties, but there are certainly things on there that are useful if you are um, someone who's interested in this in terms of your private home as well. And there's also an e-learning tool that you can do about museum pests. So if you want to um, 
do a little bit more on the topic, then you can um, also go through their e-learning um, and some of their quizzes as well. And that's the end of this session. Does anyone have any questions for me? Okay, you're welcome to again either type into the chat or put up your hand. OK, great. Um, and I'll just say thank you to everyone for participating. I hope that this has been really useful to you and that you've enjoyed the session. There will be a, um, a sort of short feedback survey coming th out to you after the second session. Um, so we won't be doing one specifically now. Um, so you just wait, look out for that link after we've done the second one because we always really appreciate some feedback. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much for coming and I'll see you next week. Thanks very much for that, Linda. Um, and again, everyone should already have the link to the second session. And if you don't, then please uh, do email me and I'll send that out to you. Um, enjoy the rest of your evenings.